none of that. She's a, she's kind of mysterious. That uh, we kind of know here and now what she's up to, but how does one become a necromancer? How, how does that happen? You know, what, what life choices does one make to end up in necromancy? Um, and so I'm excited in Magic Origins that we get to learn where she's from, Dominari exciting enough, and, and what exactly is the path that got her to be where she is today. She had always uh, kind of dabbled in necromantic arts as part of her study of healing. Um, she was apprenticed to a family healer, but felt like there was other magic she could be drawing on, something she had a natural affinity for that could supplement that study. So she ended up um, drawing on that to create a potion she thought would heal her brother, which ended up instead turning him into a horrible undead monster who tried to kill her. So Liliana has an especially interesting story because what, what do we see of her really before the necromancer who we know today? And it's, it's this character who was trying to heal someone and was trying to save their life. I feel like of all of the new Planeswalker cards, the Liliana card is one that best captures her story of she's a healer, she's trying to heal her brother, and she uses dark magic and accidentally turns him into a zombie by mistake. And this is absolutely horrific situation for her. It's just all gone wrong. So transforming Liliana is actually a pretty interesting deck building quest. Um, and if you build your deck right, she's one of the Planeswalkers that can actually transform into a Planeswalker side uh, early in the game, even the turn that you play her. So looking for creatures that can maybe sacrifice themselves or that can easily force themselves to die in combat is kind of one of the puzzles that this card asks you to solve. The beauty of the card is that it reflects the paradox that I think is at the heart of Liliana's identity. That she started off really wanting to help, wanting to be a healer, wanting to um, restore her brother to life and health, wanting to do good, and found that the only way she could express her power was through becoming. Evil is such a strong word, she says at one point, but um, really becoming something monstrous. Um, in much the same way as her brother did. Once we knew that we were doing 10 different worlds, Sean and his design team realized that we had 10 archetypes in 10 worlds. So let's take the 10 two-color pairs and match them to figure out the worlds. So the trick was that each character had to start on a world in which their color had to be on both worlds they visited. So let's take Liliana. Liliana is a black character, so she needed to have some black. Dominaria had to have some black. And the first place she visits, Innistrad had to have some black. So what we figured out was she was a healer. So maybe in Dominari it'd be white black and we play into that healing and, and make an archetype that's more about life gain. And then when we go to Innistrad, it's black blue because she's a necromancer and in Innistrad, the zombies are black and blue. Unholy Hunger shows another sort of fun moment in Liliana's origin. It's the moment when she got her signature headdress um, from an angel. Uh, she drew some attention on Innistrad as a powerful necromancer raising zombies from the dead, which is something that Avicen frowns upon. But she viewed the attention of the angels as kind of a testament to her growing power. Um, so an angel showed up to challenge her, a horde of zombies took the angel down, and she removed the headdress from the angel and is gently setting it on her head uh, in the art for this card. So one of the things we wanted to do, we were telling stories, so we said, you know what, let's do a cycle of legendary creatures, but not just any legendary creatures, they, they would match the five stories. That for each story, we'd have a relevant character that really mattered, that was tied to the Planeswalker. So for Liliana, like, well, we had to do one for demons, you know, like one of the big story points is how she makes a deal with the demon, and so we wanted to show Kothafed. We wanted to show, here's the demon that she's actually making the deal with. One of the things that I think people get talking about the most when they're trying to fill in the missing pieces of characters' backstories is we've, <laughs> we've, we've let people know how many demons Liliana has made a pact with for years. That's been known for a long time. And the fact that there are demons not yet named uh, is, is a favorite topic of uh, flavor enthusiasts everywhere, myself included. So uh, every time we get to reveal someone like a Grizzlebrand or, or Kothafed, it's a big deal. It's a big moment for us. Demonic Pact shows Liliana's end state at the end of her origin story with the terms of the demonic contract uh, etched into her skin and glowing purple with her magic. Um, the card is really an end game kind of card. It, uh, 
gives you four options, the last of which is you lose the game, because for Liliana, the pact is kind of a game over thing, which is why she's trying so hard to get out from under it. I guess one of the things that's really unique about Liliana is that she's not a clear-cut hero, but she's also not a clear-cut villain. And there's a moment in the story uh, when she's negotiating with Bolas, where he's basically saying, yes, you're giving up your soul, so what? You, haven't you already basically given it up? And she, she considers that, she pauses and wonders, am I really completely gone over the edge? And uh, what separates me from the demons that I'm, that I'm gonna give myself to? And her answer is just that, that moment of hesitation. The fact that she still questions it, she's, she's not quite all the way over the edge yet. Um, and that's a side of her that I think we're gonna see continue to uh, be in play.